Welcome back to Not Your Mama's History. I'm not your mammy, but I am Chaney. And today we're doing Afro Sip and Flick. You all have probably noticed that I have a deep passion for film and television. Over the past year, I've pretty much exhausted every TV show and film on most streaming platforms, and I've been looking for something a bit different. And I felt that Acorn TV fits the bill. I wanna send an extra special thank you out to Acorn TV for sponsoring today's video. Acorn TV has thousands of hours of quality and entertaining content. I've been binging The Beast Must Die, which follows the mother as she takes justice into her own hands after her son is killed in a hit and run accident and the investigation is dropped. Can you say bring on the drama? Now, Penny here, who I've been dog sitting and is a true lover of TV, watched the first few episodes of Finding Joy with me. Acorn TV has weekly releases and hundreds of exclusive shows from around the world that can only be seen on Acorn. I have not been bored yet. I am looking forward to watching season two of The Gulf, which premieres on November 22nd. It's a crime drama that will certainly keep us on the edge of our seats. I loved season one and cannot wait for season two. Did I mention that Acorn TV is commercial free and available for just $5.99 a month? It's really easy to stream. I actually watch Acorn TV on my ride into work in the mornings and on my lunch break. You can get Acorn TV by downloading the app or streaming via Apple and Android devices, Amazon Fire TV, Google Chromecast, Roku, and more. With Acorn TV, there's always something new to discover. Try Acorn TV free for 30 days by going to acorn.tv and entering code Yo Mama's History. Remember, codes are case sensitive, so enter it in lowercase, all letters. The Afro Flick and Sip segment started as a live on Instagram. And I got such good reception that I decided to make a segment here on my YouTube channel. So essentially, I review a uh, black historical film while sipping on a cocktail or two or three, depending on how the movie went. Today, I'm actually very much inspired by the ant antiquarian dinner that I talked about in the past video. And I use Hendrix Gin, always a good one. And I added a couple ounces of Hendrix Gin inspired uh, Cat's Deli pickles and the pickle juice and added some of the chopped up the pickles and put it in. And I shaked it up in a shaker. It was so delicious. This was the uh, cocktail that they came up for me, came up with for me. I love a dirty martini and so they put together something special for me and it was so good and I'm glad I can actually recreate it at home. I was worried about that. This week we're doing antebellum. I have marinated a long time on this movie. I've watched it three times. The first time I jumped around a lot because it was just too much. The second time jumped around a little bit more. The third time recently, I went all the way through. Um, I would say that this movie is trauma on top of trauma on top of black historical trauma. Um, and I think we are all asking the question, why? 
It should be understood that I'm giving a review from the perspective of someone who comes out of the living history world. I started in reenacting as a hobby and then I now do living history as a profession. I'm a historical interpreter. So I regularly dress in historical clothing and I regularly interact with reenactors around the country. So just keep that in mind while I review this. I have such mixed feelings about this movie. When I first heard about it, um, people were like, oh, it's like Octavia Butler's Kindred. Um, and after watching it, I have to say, no, it has nothing to do with Octavia Butler's Kindred, the book. It's a, the book is amazing. I would definitely advise you to read it, um, but it's two different genres. So this is like fantasy, uh, Kindred is like fantasy, and Antebellum is horror. Um, and I would say that as the genre goes, it is successful. Um, in achieving the goals of being a horror film. And I did collect the definitions of what a horror film is supposed to be. A horror film is one that seeks to elicit fear in the audience for entertainment purposes. Horror films additionally aim to evoke viewers' nightmares, fears, revulsions, and terror of the own unknown and macabre. Again, I think that this film was successful in achieving these. This does not mean that it should have been made, um, but in achieving the goals of becoming a horror film, it was successful. I want to first tell you that we will have spoilers through all of this, so here is your official spoiler alert for, the entire, uh, for this entire video. So we have Eden, who uh, we're introduced to her at the beginning. She is an enslaved woman who was recaptured. Um, in the first scenes, we see her being brought back. Um, we see other enslaved persons who were brought back, but they are, one of them gets away and she is horrifically murdered by a Confederate soldier. Um, again, I said, from beginning to end, we have tra black historical trauma. So Eden is portrayed by Janelle Monet. Um, of course, Gabrielle Sidibe is in this as well. Uh, Janelle Monet's daughter, uh, Kennedy, she is so cute. Her, she's um, portrayed by London Boyce. And then we have the mistress or Elizabeth. She is portrayed by uh, Jenna M Malone. And I think she, I think the acting was well. Um, Captain Jasper, Jack Houston. Um, and there was Senator Blake um, Denton. And then the director was um, Gerard Bush. He was the director and writer. Okay, so essentially, uh, creepy reenacting white folks, kidnap black people, usually successful black folks in activism or who speak out against racist um, and they put them on a creepy horrible horror filled plantation cosplay plantation where uh, black people are not allowed to speak um, they are supposed to act as slaves, they pick cotton during the day, and the women are sexually assaulted by night. There are just so many levels of problematic um, in this film. To start from the beginning, I think the most successful aspects of this film um, were the wardrobe and the set. And it's seen um, in many different ways because from the very beginning, my first comment in my notes was, why does this look like a Civil War reenactment and not a Hollywood film? Uh, first and foremost, the canvas. <laughs> At Civil War reenactments, especially the mainstream ones, you just see a sea of canvas tents. Um, and that's something that 
would not have been as common around a plantation. Um, yes, you would have seen soldiers camping in canvas tents, uh, but the level in which you see canvas, for example, in this movie is a giant tent. Would they really have built or carried with them a giant tent to house all of the soldiers for a banquet dinner every night? Is that possible? No, it is not. I have never seen that in, uh, in the reality. I mean, in um, real world application. If I'm wrong, someone in the comments let me know if you have seen um, a Civil War unit dragging a giant tent that could place all of the soldiers in that unit um, together for a banquet, a fabulous banquet each night, meaning they're probably also dragging all of the tables and the chairs with them. Um, so that was something that initially. Also, you see all of the costumes were just wrong. It looked like Civil War reenacting costumes. Someone, it looks like all of the mistakes new reenactors make, they made in the costumes. And at this point in, in Hollywood, historical costuming, a lot of their mistakes are intentionally made. For example, not putting um, a shift underneath. That's intentionally made to make, um, to accentuate women's breasts and make it look more modern and sexy. Um, but they know that they would have had shifts. Most costume designers know. Um, also, the uh, bell shape, instead of a bell shape, the um, the hoop looked like a slope and not a bell um, on the mistress. So that was a dead giveaway. Um, they weren't weighing cotton. Enslaved persons were just coming from the fields with their bags full of cotton and sitting, sitting down and picking through the cotton. That would have never happened. Um, in a cotton field, when people come back from picking cotton, it is meticulously weighed and collected. Um, they would not have taken the chance of losing profit or cotton. It's just not something that was done. Um, also, the enslaved women, the head wraps were horrible. Um, they, it looked like minstrel show head wraps. Also, the dresses were just too long. Um, how are you working in the field when you have so much fabric in your skirt or a walking through a field it's just not possible as someone who has actually picked cotton in a field in historical clothing. It's just not plausible. Um, also, the white little girl, um, the evil, evil white lady's child, she was wearing mo modern shoes in multiple scenes. So that was another giveaway. They would never do that in a historical film, a well-funded historical film, which this was. So I then from the beginning was like, oh, these mistakes were done on purpose. So um, right then and there, I knew that this was a modern film. I didn't know the full twist, but I was pretty certain that this was set in a modern era. Um, so we learn that Eden she is a highly educated woman who is an activist. She writes books. She graduated from Spelman College or Spelman University and then uh, uh, Columbia University. We then learn that the mistress is the talent scout or the headhunter. She's the one that goes out and handpicks all of the people that are brought in and put through these tortures. Um, so. I'm guessing that all these people were picked based off of being uh, badass black people. I'm just, I'm just putting a, a guess out there into the universe. At the end, we find out that they are in a Civil War reenactment park called Antebellum. And it was owned by Senator Blake Denton, who was portraying the general. And what a piece of work he is. <laughs> and we find out that he is the one that specifically picks um, Dr. Henley, who was, uh, in, who was Eden on the plantation. 
and he puts her through tortures. Now to jump into some of the most problematic aspects of this film, which are many, <laughs> um, I would first say, as I said at the beginning, there's so much trauma, trauma with no purpose. And what is made even sickening, more sickening, is that there's no real character development. So we are seeing these people endure trauma after trauma without understanding a basic of who they are, which I think is something that, um, has been very common with black characters through the history of cinema. And this film just carries on with the same old, same old. And I had hoped that if they were wanting to make a commentary about, about modern day race relations, they should have developed these characters more. Um, the only real explanation we're given about why this is being done, why these white folks are doing this, is through the general speech at one of the evening's dinners. So the general says, this is the only hope we have of retaining our heritage, our way of life. This land is our rightful inheritance and rest assured, our nationalist state will not be stolen from us by these traitors to America. The biggest problem with this movie, I keep saying this, but there are so many problems, but this may be one of the biggest or the second biggest behind no character development is that they do not reiterate anywhere else why these white folks are doing this. It's in a speech, it's during a part of, of the movie where there's so much going on that if you're focusing on him, it is, it is a blessing that you actually hear what he's saying to be able to understand why these people are doing this. So, so problematic. <laughs> so I wish that they had kind of reiterated it multiple times in many different ways. It would have been very helpful for people to know why. I would say um, the cinematography was beautiful. Whoever did it knew exactly what they were doing. The contrast of colors, it was just sweeping landscapes, the focus on people's faces, emotions, and pulling people out of the scene to focus on them, which they should have done with character development. But alas, it was done with uh, cinematography. There's one scene of this woman running for her life. She's a beautiful black skin against this green dress. It was just, it was perfect uh, for the, for that scene. And I think it's amazing. Also in her modern life, um, when you see Dr. Henley in her house with her child, she's dressed in these brilliant reds and her daughter's dressed in these brilliant yellows. It just pops them out and really sets them, sets them in time. I, I think it was beautifully done. Um, that's one of the things that I think did really well. Um, another thing, has the creator spent time with black people? I'm not asking if this creator is black because we know one of the creators is black. My question is, is he culturally black? Does he spend time with black people? I don't know. Um, he could and just decided to go off and do something different. I don't know. But just the way the movie reads, uh, number one, it reads as if a white liberal wrote most of the speaking parts. And it read as if um, someone who doesn't spend a lot of time with actual black people. That's just... You know, that's just my take. I could be wrong. Um, I think something that this person forgets is that in order for slavery to have been successful, 
it was a whole system around slavery to keep someone enslaved. We weren't in a society just with slavery. We were in a slave society. So every aspect from the laws to the officials within the society to the average Joe who was renting enslaved persons for different tasks or for someone when an enslaved person ran away and said, please help me, they called the slave patrol. Like it's, it's so many things were just overlooked to just enslave people in a reenactment park. Um, in order for someone to have been enslaved, it took a lot of mental manipulation and brainwashing from a young age. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of people just don't really understand. You can't just take an average person today and just throw them into slavery. Um, yes, with the punishment of physical harm, yes, you can get them to do what you want for a while, but in reality, they are still modern black folks who will mess you up. <laughs> I just, just know when black folks today, <laughs> if you really think you can get uh, my family and put them in a, a slave reenactment, <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying, it just, it doesn't add up, y'all. It doesn't add up. But I come to this film um, as someone who is a black reenactor. I come through a reenacting background. Um, many people have told me that none of this is possible. Um, this would have never happened in real life. I agree. This would not have happened exactly in real life, but I know for a fact that aspects of this have happened because I have seen it with my own eyes. I have gotten requests from white reenactors to participate in things like a actual slave hunt um, with real bloodhounds. I had requests to be whipped with an actual whip, but they did say they would only do it lightly. Um, I've also had um, requests to actually slap me or call me certain names. Like there, this could absolutely happen because I find that people enjoy the fantasy aspect of the past, but specifically of plantations. They love to fall into the fantasy world. So I do believe that this is possible. Um, and I know it's so unbelievable, but talk to many different reenactors, black reenactors who have reenacted um, in Civil War. You will find that they get requests all the time to participate in blackface minstrel shows for the for the uh, entertainment of participants at reenactments. Like these are very common requests. Um, so this is absolutely possible. I think one of the biggest problems this movie had with connecting with the audiences was because that they didn't set the audience up for understanding the purpose of this movie or the reality of this movie. Um, people came to this movie thinking that it was a story about slavery. This is in no way, shape or form a story or a movie about slavery. It's a movie about modern people in the modern world with commentary on, um, race relations in the modern world. It has very little besides the reenactment to do with slavery. And I know that's very hard to get beyond um, because this is not, even though it's people being enslaved, this is not about historical slavery. This is about modern situations. And I think if they had set people up for that mindset, it would have been a lot more successful in getting people to understand.
also, if they had done a lot more um, character development, it wouldn't have been so offensive. Um, it is offensive to take black people and traumatize them, whip them, rape them, and then not provide any context as to why this was happening. Lastly, I think there's also this very interesting thing that's going on right now. At a time when we know and understand the most about our racial history, of the, the history of the past, of how we got here, especially here in America, we have those resources. Everyone, liberals, conservative, moderates, everyone is striving to go back to the past. They're striving in our food and recipes, in our fashion, um, in, our, um, in our readings, in our entertainment, um, everything, we're striving to go back to the past. And I find that very interesting. Um, I think that's something that we need to keep an eye on. And I'm not immune to it, obviously. I mean, I, um, I design historically, historically inspired clothing and fashions. Um, but I think that's something we need to analyze about ourselves um, and keep a close eye on. Other than that, I think this movie was interesting. I don't think that it was terrible. Um, everyone was like, it's awful, it's terrible. I think it has a pro lot of problematic things about it. But I think a year out from its release, looking back at it, um, I don't think it was terrible. I think it's flawed. And I think we can take and learn some things about this film so we don't do it again. Thank you so much for joining us. Please remember to like us and subscribe. This pickle martini, it's really good. It is really good. A special thanks to our patrons on Patreon. Without you, none of this is possible. Thank you for all your support.